We talk about uh, chewing gum and walking at the same time. The concern is that in supplying weapons to the Ukrainians, the United States might be stressing its bandwidth to be able to deal with a major conflict like, say, with China. Uh, the punchline is, no, this is not something I'm worried about at all, uh, for the simple reason that the people would be doing the gum chewing and the walking are different people. Any sort of military conflict that the Americans are going to get involved with with the Russians is going to be primarily on land, first and foremost, in Ukraine itself. That's an army job. And any conflict that's going to involve the Chinese is going to be on the high seas. That's a Navy's and, to a lesser degree, Marine's job. So, the United States is perfectly capable of fighting two wars if they're very different sorts of wars. So I'm not worried there, uh, number one. Number two, uh, nothing has happened with the Ukraine war yet that has really hit American military preparedness. So let's hit this first from the weapons point of view, what's already been given. Most of the stuff that the Americans provided to the Ukrainians are things that the U.S. military hasn't used itself since at least the 1990s, and in most cases further back. This is army surplus that is generated or two technologically behind the military uses. And so really the Ukrainians are just going through our hand-me-downs. Now, we would have given these things to the Allies. Uh, that's what we did at the end of the Cold War, for example. But most of the militaries in Europe have been downsizing or skipping a generation of technology. They just left all this stuff like Himars uh, in around in warehouses. So with a couple of notable exceptions, uh, these are not things that the U.S. uses at all, uh, the notable exceptions. <clears throat> there are currently two Patriot batteries operating in Ukraine. That is very close to the top of the aircraft that the United States has. Uh, right now, um, I would argue that even though taking those out of American service might be hit the strategic issue for the U.S. a little bit, it's worth it because we're getting real-time experience uh, with U.S. technology in third-party hands against top-of-the-line Russian equipment, most notably uh, the Kinzel cruise missiles. And we now know for certain that even without American personnel operating them, the, the Patriots can put down things that the Russians have. That was a great bit of information that we didn't have before. Uh, the other thing is um, artillery shells. Now, the United States has not been engaged in a massive war. It's Vietnam. Uh, even when you look at like, the Gulf Wars, uh, they were very short lit events. Uh, and so we haven't had to use artillery in volume for a very long period of time in the United States, uh, which means that our production of artillery cells has been paired to the bone. And we are going through, we the Ukrainians are going through more artillery cells in a month than the United States can produce in a year, and Europe is even further behind when it comes to munitions. Uh, so that has prompted the United States to give Ukrainians weapon systems that we are in the process of phasing out. And most notably, that is the cluster munitions that you may have seen in the news recently. Now, a cluster munition is one where it's a single uh, piece of explosive. There are dozens or hundreds of little bombs spread over an area. Uh, the Ukrainians uh, have been on the receiving end of these weapons since the beginning of the war. Russians have preferred to use the cluster munitions whenever they're targeting a uh, city. Uh, they'll use their cities when they're going against things like tanks. And so there's already hundreds of thousands, if not tens of millions, of these little bomblets, some of which haven't exploded, scattered across all of eastern and southern Ukraine. Uh, armed control advocates aren't thrilled, uh, but from the Ukraine point of view, they're like, gimme, 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 because they need whatever they can get, and obviously they're going to use cluster munitions on their population centers. That's the job for the Russians. Anyway, these are weapons that are, for it's a little distasteful, and the United States Army was in the process of taking them out anyway. So again, this kind of falls into the category of surplus stuff, even if it's not quite kind of there. Anyway, uh, bottom line, U.S. military preparedness really hasn't been affected by this war to this point. Uh, if anything, it's proving to be a useful proof of concept for how the U.S. is likely to fight wars in the future. In the aftermath of the war in terror in Iraq and Afghanistan, there is no political support in the United States for a mass deployment for anything except for top-level national defense. Uh, that's not seen as an issue right now. No one's dumb enough to attack the United States directly. At least I don't think that's going to happen. Um, which means that U.S. strategic policy is going to be operating through third parties and or using special forces. And so with the Ukraine war, we have a motivated third party who is very willing to be an ally, accept our training and equipment, and we're finding out how well that works and getting some expertise and figuring out what to do better the next time around. So all in all, in a weird sort of way, you can kind of thank the Russians for getting to the United States to where it needs to go.
both getting rid of its op web in here let's start with the most obvious one um, even if these things start to ship today they're not going to be there in sufficient numbers or with the infrastructure to support it in time to have any impact on this fighting season so the summer counteroffensive that the ukrainians are fighting in an attempt to break the Russian position in southern Ukraine in Crimea, uh, they're not going to be able to help with that at all. Uh, there's more to having the jets than simply having the pilots. You have to have the logistical infrastructure to supply them with fuel, with spare parts, especially with munitions, and they have to be able to do all of the repairs and all of the maintenance within Ukraine proper. Now, we know for certain that the United States has been doing steps to accelerate this process over the last few months. We know that there have been a number of Ukrainian pilots across the United States and NATO bases system uh, that have been training on the uh, F-16s and getting flight time. But there's going to be a lot more that needs to be done in terms of the maintenance side of the equation. Okay, so that's piece one. This is something that's going to affect over the winter and then into next year. Uh, second, uh, the players, the Netherlands and Denmark, basically run almost exclusively American-equipped forces. Uh, so there is no way that this came out of left field. Copenhagen and The Hague undoubtedly uh, have been coordinating with Washington since the beginning on this. And if they're doing it, you can bet your ass that there are going to be any number of NATO countries, up to and including the United States, who are going to be following suit now that the seal has been broken. It's just a question of timing. Now, again, this is something that's going to impact operations over the winter and into next year. Not right now. Uh, third, what's next? Uh, the next big step of what the Ukrainians have on their wish list that they haven't gotten is longer-range weaponry that will allow them to strike deeper into the occupied territories and, in their mind, ideally even into Russia proper. Now, the primary reason why this specific request has been denied so far by all of the Western allies is they don't want to provoke the Russians to direct fight. But as the Russians move deeper and deeper into isolation, and as it becomes, becomes possible that this is going to be a broader conflict in economic terms, even if not in military warrants, that argument has been losing luster in a number of places in the Western world. No one wants to start World War III, obviously, but it's pretty obvious who's doing the raping and the genocide, and that is no one on the West side of the line. So, we are going to see longer range weapon systems. I don't want to comment on which ones because there's any number of things that could come into play. Uh, and the argument that they cannot be used within Russia proper is weakening as well. Now, it's a political decision if they decide to remove that stricture. But if you look at what's been happening over the last few weeks, the Ukrainians have been provided with storm shadow missiles by the Brits. And that's a longer range weapon system, more than capable of striking into Russia proper, but the Russians have not once used it to do so. At the same time, the Ukrainians have developed a number of weapon systems, including drones launched by special forces troops and suicide drones uh, that are maritime in style to directly attack Russian targets within Russia proper. They don't necessarily need Western tech to take the war to Moscow. And since we're seeing this blurring of capabilities, the idea that simply because a weapon has a range that could be problematic, that it automatically is problematic, that argument is fading very, very quickly. There's still going to be a lot of brackets on all of this. This is not going to be something that's going to change overnight. But now that they're going to be getting NATO fighter aircraft that clearly have the capacity, if you put an extended range fuel tank on them to strike Moscow directly, you got to ask yourself... What else can be pushed across the line at this point? And that's the discussion that's going to be happening in Brussels, in London, in Berlin, in Paris, and Washington quite aggressively over the next couple of months. And by the time we get to the end of the year, I have no doubt that in addition to longer range missiles, artillery systems, and jets, there'll be a whole phalanx of additional technologies going to be handed over in order to help the Ukrainians out. And for those of you who say that this is costing the United States too much, number one, check your math. With the exception of two Patriot batteries, every single other thing that has been transferred from the United States to this point has been spare parts and decommissioned equipment that we were going to have to pay to dismantle. So in many ways, the Ukraine war has saved us a lot of money. And second, if you think the money has been stolen, uh, you're literally just making that up. Call your congressperson because they have every day a full list of every piece of equipment, how it was used, how it was transferred, and how much money it actually cost the United States. And anyone who tells you otherwise is lying to you. Uh, the one that caught the most attention from people is actually pretty funny. And the statement is that uh, 
Russia asserts that it has the world's second most powerful military, and a number of people believe them. But now people are saying that Russia is the second most powerful military in Ukraine. Now, um, I got a good chuckle out of that one because the Russians are not doing very well, and the Ukrainian counteroffensive is clearly deep into shaping operations. Uh, but before you celebrate Russia's weakness, uh, a little bit of history. I'm not going to talk about the weapons or the reserves or how many tanks the Russians have because, oh my God, they got so many. Instead, we'll look back at history. Uh, Russia has never been a capital intensive power, it has always relied upon numbers to fight its war and for the weather to do a lot of the heavy lifting and for distance to inhibit the ability of its foes to function in its territory. What that leaves us with is a country that is both fragile and incredibly strong at the same time, historically speaking. And so when a country will come at the Russians with a technological advantage, especially when it involves movement, they, they will do great. Because once you break through the outer perimeter, if you can get fast and loose into Russian core territories, the Russians can barely move within their own territory. So whether it's the British at um, the Crimean War or the French in early 1800s, or the Poles during the time of Troubles, or the Japanese in 1905. You know, it doesn't really matter what era of history you're looking at. You can find easily a major war where the Russians were absolutely crushed. But it's one thing to defe defeat Russia's armed formations, and it's quite another to eliminate Russia as a threat in the long term. One just requires hitting their troop concentrations and their logistics packages. The second requires root and branch or ripping up much of the industrial level infrastructure and the entirety of the governing structure over a swath of territory that is the world's largest national landmass. So I understand what Blinken is after here. He's trying to rally the alliance to give a lot now when it's going to really make a big difference to the Ukrainians. This is going to be a critical year for them. But on the other side of this, we're going to have to deal with either a resurgent Russia or a very, very bitter Russia that still has a few thousand nuclear weapons. Uh, we're at the very beginning, still, of a very long process. And even if this goes every way that people who are rooting for the Ukrainians hope, and this really is the beginning and the end of the Russian system, uh, belittling them now isn't going to speed that process along outside of the kind of the tactical boost that it gets from people giving more weapons in the short term. Anyway, word of warning, I'm, I'm still rooting for the Ukrainians here, still hoping, and actually I'm pretty confident that Russia will cease to exist as a country in my lifetime. Love to see that forward loaded, but I'd like to see it to, without a nuclear exchange too. And 25th, uh, a guy by the name of Prigozhin, who is the leader of the Wagner paramilitary group, who has been an unofficial arm of the Russian military now for several years, has launched an arm in its direction. His troops have left their positions in Ukraine. They have moved into Russia proper. They have captured the city of Rostov-on-Don, which has a population of about 1 million. They're attempting to flip Russian troops to their sides. Uh, and the Russian government, uh, Vladimir Putin himself, has declared Prigozhin to be a traitor uh, and has called upon the military and security services to crush him. Uh, Prigozhin has said that the president is misinformed, but it's okay because we're going to have a new president soon anyway. Uh, <laughs> as someone who very vividly remembers duck and cover drills and uh, is very aware that the Russians have been aiming nuclear weapons at us uh, my entire life, uh, there's something just deeply hilarious about this. Evan. <sighs> The trick here is to not blow anything too much out of proportion because there's a lot we don't know. So let's start with what is certain. Uh, Rostov Adan is the primary logistical and communications point for the Russian military in the entirety of the Ukrainian war. So first and foremost, the Ukrainians are making a lot of popcorn here and are getting very serious about their counteroffensive. Now, until this point, at least until the 23rd, the counteroffensive was not going particularly well in any battle where the Ukrainians are facing off against the Russians. 
and the Russians only lose three times as many troops as the Ukrainians do, that's a battle that the Ukrainians have lost. They're at a huge material and demographic disadvantage, uh, and they just haven't been able to achieve breakthrough. Uh, there are multiple lines of defenses that the Russians have built over recent months. It starts with minefields, and as you get further back, it's anti-tank barriers and trenches. And for the most part, the Ukrainians haven't been able to get through the minefields. So I don't want to call it a failed offensive. I don't want to call it a stalled offensive. It's, but it's definitely not been going as much as well as they'd hoped. But on the 23rd, we saw two things. Uh, number one, a change in military strategy. Uh, the Ukrainians had gone from targeting command and control bunkers to targeting ammo uh, dumps, which is something you usually do before a big push. And uh, the Chughar Bridge uh, in Crimea uh, was hit by a few missiles to make the rail system completely impassable until repairs are done. Now, the Russians do have the technical capacity to do that, but it's going to be something that takes weeks, which means that there was this window in western Ukraine where the Russians in the western half of the front from Militopol west uh, were not able to function. Um, and that provides an opportunity for Ukrainian forces. Now, I'm going to put all of that together now in a video from something that I was originally planning on posting before the coup started. So here's the Ukrainian section of that, and then we'll come back to the Russian section. Uh, we're now well into the third week of the conflict, and the Ukrainians haven't achieved any sort of breakthrough. Uh, there's two main lines of defense that the Russians are trying to hold. The first is a series of minefields, and the second is a series of more strategic defensive emplacements like Dragon's Teeth and Trenches. And the Ukrainians haven't really been able to get past the minefields to get to the real defenses yet. Uh, and what that means is they've just kind of been bogged down in attritional fighting. And because the Russians have an order of magnitude more industrial plant and reserves and at least a factor of three more population, any battle in which the Ukrainians are duking out uh, mano a mano is not one that they're going to do well in. In fact, any battle where the Ukrainians only kill three times as many Russians as they lose in their own troops is a battle they've lost. So it, uh, instead of seeing the dramatic breakthroughs that we saw in Kyrgyzstan and Kharkiv last summer, uh, it's been a slugfest and it hasn't gone well. That said, a couple things. Number one, we're still early in the offensive. They're still probing for weaknesses. They're still going after command and control. And then second, in the last 96 hours, a few things have changed. Uh, first of all, uh, three, four days ago, the Ukrainians shifted from using their missiles to target command and control systems to uh, going after ammo dumps. And you would do that when you're getting to the next phase of the operation. You feel like you've broken up their ability to react, and now you're trying to not just to trip their forces, but make sure that the forces cannot actually get meaningful supplies. But the real issue happened the morning of Thursday, the 22nd of June, when the Ukrainians put some serious holes in a few supply bridges that are critical for Russian forces. And to understand the significance of that targeting shift, we need to look at a few maps. Here's our first map of the Ukrainian space. Nothing too ex exciting here. Uh, the red line is roughly where the front is. The Russians occupy the territory to the east and south of that line. And the yellow bars are where the Ukrainians have put their primary thrusts. Now, the, the one on the left there, that's the Zapranitsa front. Uh, the Ukrainians have been expected to go in that direction since the very beginning of this conflict, uh, because if they can push down to the Sea of Azov, they can basically isolate the entirety of the southwestern front and Crimea, because not only would there no longer be a land bridge between Russia proper and Crimea, but the Ukrainians would be able to target the Kerch Strait Bridge directly. Uh, but they've had more success going further into the east because there are fewer defensive works. But still, in all these cases, you're talking about advances in the single digits of kilometers. No sort of strategic breakthrough where mobile Russian forces, excuse me, where mobile Ukrainian forces can get in behind the Russians and isolate them and break them up and enforce strategic retreats and routes. Okay, here's a zoom in on Ukraine. Uh, the single most important thing here is, of course, the Kerch Bridge. An attack, uh, unclaimed attack, we don't really know who did it, uh, but either the Americans or the Ukrainians took out... Uh, one of the spans of the Kerch Bridge last summer. Now, the Kerch Bridge has three lines to it. Two two-lane road connections and one rail connection. The 
Ukrainians, Americans, whoever it happened to be, were able to take out one of those two-lane road connections and start a series of fires on a rail car that was going by on the rail bridge at that time, which warped the bridge and made it impossible to handle cargo. So no more trains in and out of Crimea from this route, and it used to be the primary route, and only two of the four road lanes. So everything has to go on truck, and when they do have convoys coming or going, they have to shut it down to other traffic. So that was a big hit, and it forced the Russians to shift their supply route over to this area, to the land connections that go into Crimea. So let's zoom in there. Now, first thing to understand about this area is a lot of this is not land. This entire zone here is a series of brackish lakes, which obviously you're not going to be running cargo across. In fact, there's only really two ways to cross. On the left, you've got the proper land connection, which is an all-land route that goes through southern Ukraine. It is the furthest connection from the front. It's not that the infrastructure there doesn't work, it's just that it's not great. However, if you go to the yellow arrow, the one further to the right to the east, you're looking at the Chanhar crossing. Now, Chanhar has a rail connection and a road connection. And it's these connections that the Ukrainians put some holes in. They use a special kind of warhead, uh, which I'm not going to go into detail because it's not my focus, uh, but it blew all the way through the concrete, blew all the way through the rebar, put a giant hole right in the middle of the thing. You're not taking trucks across that. You're not taking rail across that until such time as these are repaired. Repairing it is not beyond the capacity of the Russians, but keep in mind that it's been months since Kerch had that hole put in it, and the rail connection there has still not been rebuilt. One of the many, many downsides of the Soviet dissolution is we've had a simultaneous education crisis and demographic crisis now decades in progress. The technical education system in Russia collapsed back in the 80s, and their demographics... Well, They've had a death rate that's been higher than the birth rate for 30 years now, which means that the youngest suite of people who have the full skill set to be technical experts, they're in their 50s right now. They'll turn 60 this year on average. They still haven't replaced the, the span and courage. They still haven't replaced the rail system. There's a question as to whether they can. Now, the Chonar crossing is not nearly sophisticated. Instead of being a high elevated suspension bridge, it's a low block bridge. It's not blocking navigation or anything. This is not a navigable waterway system. They probably can do it, but it's going to take them a few weeks, which means in the meantime, any cargo going to and from Ukraine has to come from that Western bridge. And this means that the soldiers in Ukraine, the Russian soldiers in occupied Ukraine, are facing a double bind. Back to this map. Notice the city of Mariupol. Basically, any Russian troops that are west of that zone um, have basically been cut off from supplies that come from Russia proper off in the east. They got everything they needed from Crimea, which is, you know, more difficult to support now. And now with the Chanar Bridge offline, it's going to take about a week for the Russians to reroute everything further west to then cross a larger distant chunk of territory. That would suggest to me that the Ukrainians are as ready as they can possibly be to make a push in that direction. Now, coming down from Zaporizhia, it doesn't really matter where they penetrate as long as they reach the Sea of Azov. It could be east of Mariupol, it could be west of Militopol, it could be anywhere in between. Any way that they can cut that land bridge forever and then have the range in order to hit the remains of the Kerch Bridge direct. If we're going to see an attack, if this counteroffensive is going to really manifest as something, these are exactly the circumstances you would expect the Ukrainians to shape, and now they've done it. And since there's going to be a window before the Russians can redirect supplies further to the west, the troops in the Melitopol area are now completely cut off, vulnerable, they're not going to get reinforcements, they're not going to get fuel, they're not going to get artillery shells and ammo. Now would be the time. Now, that's the strategic picture that we're seeing right now. Okay, now back to the Russian side of things with the coup. Rostovan Don is the primary jumping-off point for Russian forces into Crimea and the southern front. And as long as Rostovan Don is offline, it is impossible for any Russian forces anywhere in the Crimea or in occupied Ukraine uh, to reinforce, to get more troops, to get equipment, to get fuel. 
So this is a beyond a golden opportunity for the Ukrainians to give the Russians a serious drubbing. The question is, how long will it last? Uh, while there have been many, many reports saying many, many, many things, there is no sign of direct large-scale fighting between Wagner forces and Russian forces at the moment. Uh, but the Wagner forces are definitely in command of the logistical train on which the entire Russian army in Ukraine depends. And in that sort of situation, um, wonderful opportunity for the Ukrainians. Okay, next chunk we're going to go into. The issue is that there is a canal that provides irrigation water that starts in the central parts of Kyrgyzstan province, goes south to the Crimean Peninsula, and then is the sole source of irrigation water for the entire peninsula. The area is historically very dry, and while you might be able to grow a little bit of wheat there in a normal year, everything else has to be irrigated, and honestly, the wheat can use it too. Now, the sluice gate that controls the flows is on the south side of the Dnieper River between the cities of Kakova and Nova Kakova, and it drains water from the Kakova Reservoir. So, you know, it's easy to remember all the names on this one. Uh, what the Russians have been doing is running that canal full bore for most of the winter in order to fill up all of their downstream reservoirs in Crimea itself. Now, all of those reservoirs combined are like a drop in the bucket compared to what can come out of the Dnieper. And it's not enough for irrigation if, if the sluice gate is closed. It would be enough to supply drinking water to the populations of Crimea, but none for irrigation at all. Now, the Ukrainians are saying that until they take over Nova Kakova and Kakova, that there's really no conversation to be had about the canal, but we are probably nearing the point where that's going to be relevant. If the Ukrainians were to do a direct assault on those cities across the river, that probably wouldn't go all that well because the Russians have deep supply lines and the Ukrainians would have to cross a river without a bridge. Uh, more likely, the Ukrainians are going to be operating further east, where they'll go east of the river altogether and go straight south from Zaporizhia province. But there are reasons to think that the Ukrainians might prioritize hitting that sluice gate, even if they don't intend to capture it. The single biggest one is because of power. Uh, the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, that one that keeps getting in the news because of shelling, draws all of its coolant water from the Kakova Reservoir, and the Russians have been deliberately draining that reservoir as fast as they can, faster than the river can refill it. Now, because there's so little capacity in the Crimean system to hold water, they're probably just dumping the water somewhere into the ocean, but I don't have access to uh, live feed satellite technology in a war zone, so I don't exactly know where. But that's probably happening somewhere. They wouldn't be put into the fields because this is planting season and that would prevent them from, you know, getting any food at all. Anyway, uh, if that plant goes offline, it's going to be a problem for any number of future Ukrainian operations because it is the primary source of electricity for that entire area and the entirety of the Ukrainian steel belt. But if the canal was taken offline, even temporarily, not only do you trigger a crisis in Crimea because, you know, there's a food issue, uh, you also uh, trigger potentially a nuclear meltdown crisis. Uh, there's another reason to expect uh, the Ukrainians to do this sooner rather than later, because we're about to have Crimea cut off. If the Zaporizhia offensive proceeds, basically going straight down from roughly the nuclear plant, power plant towards the Sea of Azov, the Ukrainians will be in easy range of every road and rail connection between Russia proper and the Crimean Peninsula, and they'll be able to cut them all off. You do that at the same time you cut the canal, and this is an area that's completely on its own. Two and a half million people and some of the best military units the Russians have. So the strategic rationale for this move remains very, very strong. The only question is how high up on the priority list is it for Kiev? Because they can't just flip a switch. They actually have to go in and do something. Doesn't mean that they won't, just that there are other things competing for their attention right now. All right, that's it for me. See you guys next time. Uh, by the Russians, about 16 missiles, of which six were the new Kinzels. Those are the supersonics that can go 10 times the speed of sound. According to the Ukrainians and according to satellite telemetry, all of them were shot down. Now, the Kinzel is important because it's got decent range and because it's super fast and supposedly can evade any sort of missile defense. And so for an entire flight of them to be shot down, you know, even if the Ukrainians are lying and the date of gaffs right now is wrong, so even if it's only half of them, that's still a big deal. There's only one Patriot missile defense battery in all of Kiev, which means one of two things happened. Either number one, that one Patriot stopped the entire flight 
or the Kinsels were more dispersed and non-patriot systems took out the flight. It really doesn't matter which is true, because it means that the most lethal, fastest, most advanced weapon in Russia's arsenal can be taken out with actual relative ease. And that means that if you are anyone who in the future might be facing down the Russian war machine, the Russians don't have a quality advantage over you anymore. So pretty much any American defendant installation, I don't want to say they have nothing to fear from these things, but all of a sudden, when the capacity of the Russians to get past American air defenses looks significantly degraded, and the Russians don't even have anything in development that is better than the Kinzel at this point. So, you know, take the good news where you can. Mobilization and ammo. Uh, the Russian military support system, their military industrial complex, is clearly not doing well. Uh, so much money has been stolen from the system that it's difficult for the Russians to get stuff to the front. And their internal logistical system is trapped. So between not having as much as they thought they did, between the government uh, being fleeced blind by their own defense minister, uh, Ukrainians interfering with transport systems via drones and sabotage and artillery strikes, and uh, general status of disarray of the Russian transport infrastructure, uh, it's an open question how long the Russians can go with this. Now, they do have 70 years of reserves. And, you know, whenever we see a 1940s or 50s tank brought out, we're like, ha, 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 look, they're pulling their old shit out. Well, a couple things there. Number one, they have shit to pull out. The Ukrainians don't. And second, we're seeing this old stuff come out because some of their newer stuff just takes longer to refurbish. If you have a pre-optics tank, getting that back into condition just requires some refurbishment, some more tubing, maybe running some fresh oil in it, and you're good to go. If you've got 1970s and 80s styles optics, you need to now replace those. And that means a much more expensive and lengthy overhaul. You may get a better tank out of it on the back end, but it does take more time and money. So they're bringing out their old stuff first. They still have several million more armored vehicles that they can throw into this. Now, it's a limited quantity, yes, but, you know, Ukraine is basically limited now to what it captures from the Russians and what the West sends, which brings us to the second point. Uh, how much durability is the logistical chain on the Western side? Uh, it's not as good as you think. When 1992 happened and the Cold War ended, uh, pretty much every country in Europe started to slim down their defense budgets until we got to the point in 2022 when the defense ministry in Germany was actually appointed by a woman whose goal was to shut down the military completely. Uh, and that means that what they do have is either old or in need of refurbishment or is from a very thin crust of stuff that has been purchased in the last 30 years. Well, most of that thin crust has already been committed either to the militaries of these forces themselves, because now the Russians are on the warpath, nobody wants to completely disarm, or the stuff has already gone into Ukraine. So you have to build new stuff if you want to send it. And the Ukrainians have to compete with all of these countries who now want to beef up their own military because, you know, the Russians are on the warpath. Now, in the case of the United States, there's a lot deeper tranche of things to pull from because we spent 20 years in the war on terror which means we spent 20 years building out our military for a task it wasn't designed for, and we were upgrading our actual, quote, real military assets, you know, our, our jets and our tanks and everything, at the same time. So the United States has a significant backlog of all of that stuff that we would have used to fight a war back in the 90s and the 80s. We don't use any of it anymore. We actually have to dispose of it. So from a weird point of view, the Ukrainians are doing us a budgetary solid by taking our old stuff off and disposing of it in the Russians' mouths. Uh, but even here, limited supply. So we're trying to spin up artillery creation here. The Europeans are using some of their solidarity funds to buy ammo. But in all cases, you're talking about needing to triple or quadruple our current manufacturing facility for a lot of this equipment simply to keep with where we are right now. The process has been started, but it's expensive and it's time-consuming. And we're not going to see a real impact, especially on the European side, this calendar year. We're really talking about the second half of 2024 before the Western industrial complex really becomes a meaningful factor in terms of the supply of equipment. Ammo will come a little bit earlier. So that's the first kind of really dark side. The second, even darker side is if you look at history, the Russian wars are very rarely quick. 
you know, everyone thinks of World War I and World War II, which only lasted a few years, as being how wars are fought. And that has been how it is in the industrial age. But if the Russians, and to a lesser degree, the Ukrainians can't maintain an industrial level of output, and this becomes more of a long-term slug match, the Russians have been expanding bit by bit over the last four centuries. And various groups that they have occupied refer to things like the Russian encroachment as the 200 years war. Ukraine wasn't captured in one lightning conflict. It was con captured in a series of conflicts over a century. The same is true for most of Russia's frontiers. It ebbs and flows and ebbs and flows. Remember, the Russians here are trying to seek a more defensible perimeter. And that means going through all of the flat, open territories that are near them. And all of Ukraine is open and flat. So history tells us that this is less a discrete conflict and more just the normal status of what it's like to be on the Russian borderlands. And then, of course, there's the dark, 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 truly dark possibility, and that's demographics. Ukraine has among the world's worst demographics. Uh, you generally have kids when you feel uh, positive about your future, and there hasn't been a lot to be positive about in Ukraine for the last 25 years, and especially since the Russians invaded the Donbass and Crimea in 2014. It has one of the world's lowest birth rates and is an extraordinarily distorted demographic structure with fewer people in their 40s than their 30s and their 20s than their teens than children. And that was before the war. We now have at any given time at least a million, probably closer to three million, Ukrainian men involved in the military conflict or training. And in addition, one third of the population of Ukraine pre-war, so almost 15 million people, are internally displaced or refugees. Finally, most of the refugees, you're talking in excess of two million people here most days, I mean, that number fluctuates a lot, are women and minor children. Well, folks, Birth rates don't recover unless the men and women are in the same place. And the longer those women and children are in a third country, the less likely they are to ever come back, and then the Russians are doing damage on their own side. Based on whose numbers you believe, somewhere between several thousand and several hundred thousand Ukrainian miners have been kidnapped, sent through what they call filtration camps on the Russian border, and shipped out throughout Russia. Uh, the Russians aren't even denying this has happened because they have a minister <laughs> who's responsible for it, has done a number of commercials advertising Ukrainian children by the dozen for mass adoption anywhere that's not close to the Ukrainian border. She specifically wants people in Siberia to pick them up. And the Russians are doing everything they can to destroy any data related. They don't keep track of the data at the filtration camps. They destroy any documents the kids have. And so getting these kids back, even if the Russians have outsized victory in the battlefield, is going to be a long and maybe impossible slog. Because a 14-year-old who is going to remember enough about Ukraine to maybe, with the right access to information and communication, be able to issue a call for help. A 3-year-old can't. A baby certainly can't. So, what that tells me is no matter how this war shakes out, we are in the final generation of Ukraine. And if the Russians are able to keep denuding their occupied territories of children, there's not going to be a lot left to fight 10 years from now, much less reconstruct the country over the next generation. And we're already talking about a reconstruction bill that is in excess of a trillion U.S. We do have a number of people in the United States who are just parroting blindly and brainlessly Russian propaganda. Uh, the argument that... The Ukrainians are led by a bunch of uh, Nazi Jewish gay demons. We're going to put that to the side because that's as stupid as it sounds. And hopefully for most people, the fact that that is a leading thread in Russian propaganda is indicative of how much truth is behind the rest of what they say. Uh, but let's focus on something a little bit more substantive. The idea that NATO has been very aggressive with the Russians uh, since the end of the Cold War. And it's ultimately uh, NATO's fault and specifically the United States' fault that Ukraine is in the position that it is today. And the Russians have to do this for defensive purposes. Uh, the very, very short version is that's utter bullshit. But let's pick it apart. Uh, the argument is that the United States has been aggressively expanding NATO. And, you know, you can make an argument for that because we have seen roughly 20 countries join NATO uh, since the Cold War ended in 1992. But you have to take a look at the NATO accession process because it is not just an issue of the United States waving a wand. What happens is the countries in question have either a vote or an act of their parliament where they apply for NATO membership, and then every individual government that is in the alliance already has to sign off on that 
entrance. And then it's not like you wave a wand. Then starts the accession process, which involves military reform, civil reform, democratic transitions, moving away from a top-down cannon fodder style military strategy like the Russians favor in favor of something with better logistics and a lot more forethought in order to help these countries not just defend themselves, but move along the path towards a democratic transition or authority democracies to consolidate that transition. Once all of that is done, once the report card is finished, the countries then formally apply and they are again have to have either an act of parliament or a vote of their general population or more likely both. And then once that is done, NATO gives it a rubber stamp, but that's not the end of the process either. Then the accession has to be signed off by each individual NATO country with a minimum of an act of parliament and in some cases an actual plebiscite. Only then can the countries join. This is not an issue of the United States just saying, hey, I want to expand the NATO to Hungary, and it just magically happens. Everyone has to be on board with every step of the process or there is no accession. Now, you also have to consider the list of countries that have joined NATO since the Cold War ended. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, the Slovak Republic, the Czech Republic, Hungary, Macedonia, or North Macedonia now, uh, Albania, and future accession targets are potentially Ukraine, Georgia, and Azerbaijan. With very few exceptions, these countries have all either been at war with or occupied by Russia. Oh, I forgot Finland. Finland too. Anyway, at war with or occupied by Russia. So from their point of view, the defensive argument that Russia is the one that's threatened by Latvia is just asinine. Uh, So that's kind of piece one. Uh, Piece two is what actually happened in the early days of the war. Uh, Starting in 2020 and 2021, uh, Vladimir Putin and the Russian government in general started talking about the Ukrainians as not really existing, that they were a made-up ethnicity designed by the Nazis or by the Americans simply to put a thorn in Russia's side. Uh, And and as such, uh, it was Russia's manifest destiny to reclaim lands that were once it. And as the uh, time went on, the number of territories that were traditional Russian territory, according to this propaganda, expanded to include most of the countries that have joined NATO (laughs) since 1992. Uh, And then by the time we got to December of 2021, the Russians started moving tens of thousands of troops onto Ukraine's borders. And by the time we got to January and early February, we had over 100,000. By the time we got to February 22nd, the day that troops crossed the border, we were at about really about 130,000. On the 22nd, over 70,000 troops crossed from the Russian territories into the occupied Ukrainian territories, and we all of a sudden had a mass mobilization in Belarus as well. And then on the 24th, forces crossed from Belarus south and from those occupied territories in the east, further west, into Ukraine proper. And never forget that this is not the first war between Russia and Ukraine since 1992. In 2014, the Russians flat out invaded uh, the Donbas territory in the east and also captured Crimea in the south. So anytime somebody tells you that this war is someone's fault other than Russia, you can tell them to go uh, have a very high weight and bulk to value ratio. So transport really is important from a cost point of view. And on average, as you know, from me, blah, 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 and forever, it costs about 12 times as much to ship uh, anything by truck as it does by water. And so Odessa and Kyrgyzstan are the big blue water ports in the area. It's always been easier in the Russian and Ukrainian spaces to get the stuff on water wherever you can and send it out. In this case, uh, there's another problem. There are rail connections that go into the countries to Ukraine's west, and some grain has gone there. But two problems. Number one, there's not nearly enough of them, and the capacity is limited. So you're talking about maybe one-fifth of Ukraine's pre-war grain could have made it out through the western zones uh, by rail. Uh, Problem number two, the rail gauge is different. So once these uh, carriages get to the border, they either need to be on a special kind of carriage where you can adjust the rail gauge car by car at the border, or you need to switch the cargo to a new carriage in order to go into Europe. And I guess there's a third problem too. What has happened for the first year is in order to maximize that 20%, they'd be going into Romania or Poland or Hungary, and then they'd dump their cargo, and then the rail cars would come back empty to get loaded up again. That is what allows 
Ukraine to hit that 20% number. The problem is Romania and Hungary, and especially Poland, are all grain producers and exporters. And all this Ukrainian grain getting dumped on the local market was pushing down the cost of local grain and forcing the Poles, the Hungarians, and the Romanians to then increase their shipments out. Well, that meant they had to pay the transport costs now as well. And it was starting to drive some local farmers out of business. So what we've seen in the last three months is most governments on the entire swath of European countries that border or are near Ukraine have stopped accepting Ukrainian cargo as an end destination. You can still transship, get it through. You can still get to a port, no problem. But that means that the carriage that used to be able to do short back and forth now has to go all the way through these countries to get to another country or to get to the coast, and then it takes up port space. And so that's taken that 20% and probably cut it at least by a third, maybe as much as half. And the only solution to this that isn't waterborne is to lay twice as many tracks or get a lot more rail cars. That's not something you do in a few months. And so we are now looking at an environment where maybe 10% of Ukraine's grain can out, get out this year. And once the Russians actually start going after the infrastructure, especially in places like Odessa, those venues close off completely. So last year was probably... Let's uh, look at this first from the American point of view. If you live in California or New York, you know, you know that gasoline prices are significantly higher than they are in places like Alabama or Texas. Uh, and it's not just about where the crude comes from. It's also about where it's processed. So yes, California and New York have higher taxes, but there's also a transport component because the stuff is produced in one area, refined in a second area, and then it has to be shipped to the third area. In the case of Russia, most of the oil production, roughly 70% of the total, is in a corridor uh, in southwestern Siberia, specifically Tatarstan and Bashkiristan, going north all the way up to the Arctic Sea. And with the exception of Tatarstan, there are very few refineries in this area. So you have to then ship the oil by pipe several thousand miles to another location where it is turned into refined product. And that refined product has to be shipped typically over a thousand miles in order to get to the Ukrainian front. There are refineries in places like Belgrade or near Rostov on Don, which is another reason why the Ukrainians have to take those two cities out of the equation. But they're really along that entire western periphery because they used to supply the former Soviet satellite states of Central Europe, as well as a little bit of exports to the wider world. Now, because the Russians have lost the Kerch Strait Bridge, they can't rail fuel to the southern front at all. And so most of this stuff has to either rail into eastern Ukraine or go by truck to everywhere else, which is one of the many reasons why the Ukrainians have been going after the truck fleet and have destroyed most of the military truck fleet at this point. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that this is one of the many, many reasons why the Ukrainians are putting so much time and effort developing technologies and getting equipment from the West to target oil infrastructure. And in that, fuel tanks are absolutely the best thing to go after, and cargo trains are probably number two, and then, of course, trucks are number three. Now, you can technically target refineries. The problem is one drone or one missile or one 2,000-pound bomb is only going to do so much damage. Refineries are huge. Most refineries, once you include the standoff distance, are something like three square miles. And they're this forest of columns and pipes. And yeah, throwing some explosives into that is generally frowned upon, but when you have a non-commercial grade explosive like say diesel or gasoline or naphtha, when you hit it with fire, yes, it burns, but it only explodes under very specific conditions. And so if you want to blow up an entire refinery, it's going to take you a huge amount of ammo to do so. And this is one of the reasons why I always found myself talking down threats to the oil sector back in the 2000s and 2010s when groups like Hezbollah or the Iranians or Al-Qaeda uh, or the Islamic State would try to target a refinery. It's just not a place where you hit it with a pinprick and you trigger a chain reactor. This is not the Death Star. And that means the Ukrainians have to follow by the same rules here. If they really want to take a refinery offline, it's a huge amount of effort. And if they are going to target a piece of energy infrastructure that's not a specific pipe or fuel cell or train, the one they're going to go after is the city of Samara in southern Russia. Samara serves as a junction point for multiple pipes coming in from northern Siberia, 
coming to and from eastern Siberia, coming up from the Caucasus, and of course going west. Roughly 40% of Russian crude is capable of going through this nexus, in addition to its refineries. Now, the Ukrainians probably do have the capacity right now to throw a drone or two into it, but again, they're going to need dozens, if not hundreds, or a lot more sabotage. So if you are going to see something a little deeper in Russia, besides what we've seen so far, which has kind of been in a band around that part of occupied Ukraine, what you're going to see is the Ukrainians probably going after the pipes themselves. It won't take things offline for very long. Pipes are easy to replace, especially in segments. But if they hit them enough, they disrupt the flows, the refineries shut down. How do we know? This happened in Chechnya during the 1990s. Uh, the Grozny region used to be the third largest refining center in the entirety of the former Soviet world, and it was a significant oil producer as well. Now that's all gone to zero, but it gives you an idea of the long, grinding, attritional fight that has to happen to really take this stuff offline for good. And so in the meantime, kind of hard to parse right now because we're kind of in a waiting period. So uh, four big things. First of all, um, there have been a number of reports that the Ukrainians have been sending special forces across in the dozens, maybe into the low hundreds, uh, from Kyrgyzstan across the Dnieper River to wreak havoc uh, behind enemy lines in southwestern Ukraine. Remember, this is an area that the Ukrainians had wanted to do a major thrust, but when the Kakova Dam was blown up by the Russians a couple months ago, that basically destroyed any possibility of using any infrastructure. So they're limited to doing small attacks like this. Uh, Normally, I would say doing assaults across a river with no supporting infrastructure would be suicide, but the Russians have clearly prioritized fighting further east, and it seems like the Ukrainians are operating with impunity. Not enough to do a major landing, not enough to bring in armor, but enough to be strategically significant. Uh, where the Russians are focusing more is in northeastern, uh, the northeastern part of the front, uh, specifically the province of Luhansk around the city of Kupiansk. I probably butchered that pronunciation, apologies. Uh, they're doing kind of a half-hearted uh, assault simply to draw Ukrainian forces away from other areas, which brings us to the third part. In Zaporizhia, the uh, Ukrainians are doing their main thrust, and they have brought in several thousand troops with better equipment and better training that have been in NATO countries over the winter. Uh, they're trying to break through. It seems that they've penetrated the first of the three defensive lines, the mines. Now they're dealing with the anti-tank infrastructure and more formidable fortifications. And the Russians are trying to bleed off the support the Ukrainians are flooding into the area. Now, remember, the Ukrainians don't actually have to break the lines. They just have to push far enough south to complicate the logistical picture for the Russians. Uh, the Ukrainians are proving that they can hit the Kerch straight bridge over and over and over. And as long as they're doing that, the Russians can't use Kerch for large-scale reinforcements or supply or fuel or ammo or anything. That forces the Russians to use the land bridge route west of Miriam. Sorry for the wind. And that's what gets us into the area where the Ukrainians are trying to interdict. It would be nice to get to the Sea of Azov, certainly. That would cut it completely. But really all they have to do is to get within a few dozen miles in order to make the Russian position in Crimea untenable. Because if you can cut the northern and the sub southern supply lines at the same time, well, then Crimea is no longer a uh, military asset for the Russians. It's an albatross around its neck that's going to cost it dearly. Uh, the only other thing I want to throw out is that there's been a lot of really bad economic data that's come out of Russia uh, in the last few days. Um, interest rates going crazy, inflation going crazy, trade going crazy. It's difficult to pay too much attention to any of this because for all intensive purposes, uh, Russia is now a wartime economy that is largely closed. And so most of the data that we would look to when we're dealing with a, a real country, a normal trading country, just isn't relevant for the Russians. For example, you know, whatever is going up or down with the ruble doesn't matter because the ruble's not internationally traded. What's happening with trade doesn't matter because the Russians are literally flying planes full of gold to other countries to pay for things. That doesn't show up in the data. We just don't know. What we do know is that this is a statist economy that is run from the top and all dynamism is gone. Now, that allows Putin and the Kremlin to direct resources to things that they think they need done and to do so relatively quickly, but it also means that everything else is becoming very, very hollow. The Russian economy is not going to recover from this. That doesn't mean that there isn't a Russia. Russia, in a number of times throughout its history, has not had a functional economy. I figured I might as well record some thoughts since I had the time. 
uh, on the topic of waiting in the wings for other people to make a damn decision. Thought it was a good time to talk about NATO membership and the case of Ukraine. Now, uh, the NATO alliance is built by a series of countries that have unanimously agreed to look out for one another's security. And that is something that has never happened in a multilateral environment before. Most security agreements that exist on the planet today and throughout human history have been at most bilateral pacts where countries are willing to back away. Uh, it's only Article 5 of the NATO alliance that actually legally binds countries to look out for one another. Now, obviously, that's the theory, and practice can be somewhat different. But the issue is that this has always been the best security guarantee among countries at any point in human history, and Ukraine wants in. And there was a great joke going on last year when the Ukrainians were doing a great job against the Russians, like, you know, that NATO is seeking membership in Ukraine rather than the other way around. The conversation is again started up about what might be necessary for the Ukrainians to actually join NATO. Uh, let me start with the punchline. Not this year, not next year, not the year after, not the year after that. For Ukraine to join NATO, one of the core issues it has to be that you don't have a border dispute with any of your neighbors. And that eliminates Ukraine right off the bat. Even if the war were to end tomorrow, the Russians are certainly going to have some quibbles with the Ukrainians when it comes to where the international border is. And until that is resolved one way or another, this is completely off the table. That was true for the Italians back in the immediate post-World War II environment. That has been true for the Croatians in the post-Yugoslav war scenarios. And that is true for the Ukrainians today. There's the second issue that while NATO was formed to keep the Russians at arm's length, NATO is not like giddy about the possibility of getting into a slugfest with a nuclear power. And so as long again as we have these hostilities going on between Ukraine and Russia, it's not that the NATO countries aren't going to put their finger on the scale and try to adjust the outcome. No, 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 no. that's not what I'm saying at all. But they don't want to get directly involved. And an Article 5 guarantee would guarantee that NATO immediately goes into a state of general war. So if you're Ukraine, I'm afraid you have to take what you can get and do what you can do on your own. NATO is there. NATO is helping. But the Article 5 guarantee, that is years ahead. And even if Russia were to be defeated completely tomorrow and its fangs removed so it could never launch another war again, only then could NATO begin the process of its 30-odd members actually going through the accession process. And that all by itself is another Florado. Haven't seen the sun here in a few days. Probably aren't going to for a few more. So uh, question number one, what happened to the half a million Russian soldiers that I was predicting three, four months ago were going to be on the field of battle by the time we got to June. Well, we're talking about Russian data and Russian information here. So here you know, on the front end and now. Uh, but the best guess we have right now is that Putin was lied to. Uh, we know that Putin is stacking his inner circle with sycophants for quite some time. There's really only about six people who he talks to at all. Only three of them are competent. And the other three, unfortunately, are in charge of the defense industry and especially the military plans in Ukraine. Uh, the two personalities that matter the most, uh, the first one is the defense minister, uh, Sergei Shoigu, who is arguably the most incompetent person in the Russian government right now, and he's obviously in charge of the broader battle plan and the entire defense industry. And we now know that Shoigu has probably stolen personally one-third of the Russian budget that was appropriated for defense equipment manufacturer uh, over the last several years, and probably one third of, or a second third, was stolen by his underlings. So whenever you see the Russians just not having enough equipment to do anything meaningful, it's probably his fault, and he's the one in charge of the battle plan, and he's the one who indicated there were going to be a lot more weapons shipments. The second defense official who arguably rivals Shoigu with his military incompetence is the guy who runs the Wagner Group, Dmitry Pragazin. Uh, this guy was literally a caterer <laughs> until a few years ago and then got a little bit of money from the uh, Russian government in order to build up this parallel military group that we know as Wagner that would go around the world hiring itself as mercenaries and committing war crimes when the local governments didn't want to. Uh, that doesn't mean he can't run a paramilitary organization, but it means he has no experience 
either managing or leading or participating in a military operation himself. And he has been leading the military operation in Bakhmut. Now, for those of you who have been following Ukrainian news, you know that the Russians have been throwing body after body after body after body against the Bakhmut city for six months now. And conservatively speaking, 20,000 Russians have died and 100,000 have been injured. The real numbers are probably significantly higher. How much higher, we don't know. But that means this one battle, which is not particularly strategically significant, where they've lost huge numbers of forces, it's taken a real bite out of any other conscription or mobilization programs that the Russian government has been instituting. So back to that half a million number. Best guess is that the Russians have lost at least 100,000, maybe as many as 200,000 men since the operation began. In addition to the at least 100,000 that were injured in Bakhmut and probably another 100,000 everywhere else. So let's add it up. When the Russians first came in in February of 2022, they had about 100, 140,000 men. They then did a partial mobilization that is as confirmed as anything as we can get with Russian data that brought in another 300,000. But if you're talking 100,000 injured throughout the war, 100,000 specifically in Bakhmut, and another at least 100,000 dead, that's the entire mobilization. <laughs> so we're probably looking at a second partial mobilization, maybe 200, maybe 250,000. But that doesn't leave Russian forces with all that many more troops than they started with, and these new troops aren't going to be nearly as skilled, which argues that the Ukrainians are going to have a relatively easy time of things. Most of these new recruits haven't really been in battle. They've been building anti-tank fortifications. And I don't know about you guys, but I've never built an anti-tank fortification myself. And if you were mobilized over the course of the last 90 days to build tank fortifications, I would argue that maybe they're not the best anti-tank fortifications that could be built. All this would suggest that the Ukrainians are going to do really well in the next couple of months. But fog of war and Russian data and people actively lying to the Russian government about the status of the war. So, okay. On to the next question.